This case is a transurdal mapping for radioembolization. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Are you from here? No, I'm from here. Next slide. Next slide. There you go. Thank um, you. Thanks. So briefly, this is a 67-year-old gentleman who has a history of compensated um, HCV cirrhosis, hepatitis C, initially diagnosed with HCC in 2013. Um, at that time, he was treated with TACE RSA to a lesion in segment 7 um, and has been doing well since then, but on surveillance imaging, was noted to have a new enhancing nodule that was in that treatment cavity. Um, his addition, like other past medical history that's relevant for him, he has uh, hypertension, um, prostate cancer that's been treated, um, as well as a triple A. Next slide. Um, medications, he's on um, blood pressure medications, and he has a, a prior history of smoking. Next slide. Physical exam, um, afebrile, um, slightly hypertensive, no icterus or jaundice. Um, his abdom abdominal exam was benign. Um, he has ECOG zero status, meaning that he is um, um, has a fully active, fully active performance status. Um, next slide. Um, relevant labs: um, total bilirubin of 0 0.5, INR of 1.1, albumin of 4.5. Um, he's a child's QA patient. His AFP is 5.2. Um, another labs are listed there. Um, next slide. Um, these are um, runs from, or rather, um, sequences of his most recent MRI, um, demonstrating both arterial and hepatobiliary phases. Um, as you can see, there is an enhancing nodule in segment 7 in the region of the prior treatment cavity. If you actually go to the next slide, um, there are still images there with the arrow pointing at the enhancing nodule there. Um, there was no other disease found in his liver. So overall, this is a 73-year-old um, male with um, hepatitis C cirrhosis, child QA, um, ECOG performance status of zero, with a new enhancing nodule in the region of previously treated HCC um, found on surveillance imaging. He is asymptomatic, and we will proceed with mapping prior to radioembolization. There we go. So I can show you what we've done so <laughs> far. So here is the, actually we used an Ultima radial catheter from Merit, which basically looks like a Sarah with no side holes. You can see here how getting down the arch. Um, basically just turned it and wire went down. We sent it over a Benson. Um, here's a Sarah selecting the, uh, the celiac artery. Again, we just sort of puffed into it, turned around. And uh, you can see the nice long proper hepatic artery, which we were ultimately able to drive out um, and actually got it into the right hepatic artery. Um, we skipped, you know, this is not sort of really our normal sequence of, of events, but uh, since he's already had an SMA and T-like angiogram, we sort of skipped some of the angiograms. We don't really need them. We already knew what his anatomy was. So we got into the right hepatic artery with the, the catheter. Um, here is our angiogram through the Ultima catheter. Um, this is about three cc's per second for about 15 cc's. Um, we don't really see any enhancing nodules here. so. Um, we did a spin, and I'll show you the spin here, just to show you, again, the machine going around. Um, we have a Phillips machine, so we have a prop, something called prop open, um, which sort of keeps the, uh, the open portion of the spin on the left side, which helps with uh, radial access here. Um, and I'll show you the, the spin images. Uh, can we go over to the 3D RA? Um, can show. Perfect. So you can see here is our, our EMBO guide. Um, if you can, Tanya, if you can scroll through the right images, um, you can see um, there's like a blue circle uh, drawn. Uh, if you go up, Tanya, you'll see it come in. Yep, there's the blue. Whoop. Okay, so you can see like the blue circle there. Um, we drew that on our tumor volume, and then um, we can sort of um, make a, a 3D roadmap. So, Tanya, if you can rotate the top left one, if you can just rotate around. Yep, that one. You just, uh, yep. You can see here we have a nice 3D RA image and a roadmap, and it basically finds us the feeder vessels. Um, it's kind of like cheating, to be honest, but uh, uh, we were able to find the, image, uh, the arteries that feed uh, the tumor. Um, so there's our spin. Um, we used, and it's just a regular roadmap, we used a, a, a 2.4 French prograde microcatheter 150. You can tell it's a 150 because it has the dual markers on it. Um, and here's our angiogram from our parent vessel. Um, Given the way the 3D RA looked and, and stuff, we decided to go a little bit further to that vessel going to about 2 o'clock, uh, which we were able, able to easily select, and uh, we got into that vessel. Um, that's actually a hand run. 
Um, and then um, we uh, did a did a spin from here. It kind of popped back a little bit on us, but uh, we did a spin, and that confirmed that we were in the uh, the right area. Um, so our plan here is ultimately we're going to inject the MAA from actually the right hepatic artery. We've had some issues with the MAA. It is it, even though it's not supposed to be embolic, we've had issues where it will block up the artery, um, especially when you're trying to get this this sub subselective. Um, and then what we're going to ultimately give him is uh, Surtex. We're going to use their uh, 3D, 3D uh, sorry, three-day flex dose, which uh, basically gives us about a seven and a half GBQ vial. We'll draw off probably just eyeballing the dosimetry here, as long as this lung shunt, lung shunt is okay, about 0.5 GBQ, which puts us at around two million spheres roughly, uh, which is about equivalent to what a, a, a glass uh, glass embolization would be, glass Y90 would be. So um, that's sort of our plan here so far. So um, do you guys have any questions? Rahul, so there's a pretty quick. All right, so uh, we're yeah. going to go ahead and do the presentation for the second half of this case. Uh, if you can go back to the PowerPoints. So again, this gentleman is 67 years old. In addition to his cirrhosis and HCC, he also has um, aneurysms of his bilateral common iliac arteries as well as, as the infrarenal um, aorta. Um, currently, on the most recent imaging, um, these aneurysms measure on the left 2 centimeters, on the right 2.5 centimeters, and in the infrarenal aorta 3.6 centimeters. All of these aneurysms have been slowly growing over time um, since we first started imaging him back in 2009. Um, his only complaint is that of mild right lower extremity claudication. Um, should we go to the next slide, please? Um, and again, he takes medication for hypertension. He has a, a long um, history of smoking, um, but has quit recently in the last seven years. Um, he does not drink alcohol. Next slide. Um, same physical exam. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, same labs. Again, next slide. Um, so these are um, on the right or rather the left, there is a, a still image from a, the, his most recent MRI, which um, is in the arterial phase, and you can see um, his aneurysms um, um, at the lower half of the, the image. Um, on the right, there is a, um, an axial um, um, venous phase CT from 2017 that's just scrolling through um, the disease portion of his aorta, just to give you a sense of the configuration. If you go to the next slide, you'll see still images from um, his imaging from 2019 compared to 2012, and you can see how much they've grown in the interim. Um, in 2012, they measured um, 2.7 in the infrarenal aorta, and then um, 1.7 and 1.5 on the right and left, um, respectively, um, and they have grown substantially since then. Um, next slide. So this is a gentleman that has an enlarging uh, left common iliac. He has enlarging aneurysms. Today we'll be treating the left hypogastric artery. We'll be embolizing that in preparation for um, um, a multi, uh, like a, a, a branched and um, um, endograft repair of the infrarenal aorta and the right common iliac artery aneurysm. Okay, thank you, sir. So yeah, so actually on the, the most recent MRI, his left common iliac aneurysm actually measures almost close to three centimeters. Um, so that's sort of why we're going to go ahead and, and treat it. So the plan is ultimately after we get him done with the Y90, because again, we're pretty confident we can get cure for the, 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 the tumor there. The plan is ultimately to do an iliac branch device for the, um, for the right side and then basically put a, just a single endograft limb for the left side. The reason we're not doing bilateral IBEs is actually the left hypogastric artery measures about 1.3 to 1.4 centimeters. So to, um, for those of you guys who do endografts, know that trying to do an IBE into an artery that size, also it's growing, is that ultimately it probably won't seal. So I think you're in the SMA. Um, so that's sort of uh, what our plan is here. So we're going to basically block up the left hypogastric artery in preparation for uh, that actually is probably it. Um, in preparation for for doing that. So what we're going to do is we're going to change out the ser the, um, the this catheter, the ultimate catheter for a, a vertebral artery ca vertebral catheter, and then we'll ultimately try to hook the left hypogastric. So this is a five French select penumbra uh, vertebral catheter. It's 120 centimeters. O actually, it's 040. 
Okay. Um, that should be good. So we're, we're more or less hubbed right here. Uh, actually, we got about five or six centimeters left of, of, of room here. Sarah's is going to puff it and confirm we are where we think we are. And then our plan is to ultimately... Um, don't, don't forget is to ultimately um, use the pod packing co pod and pod packing coils so that it's they're unfibered but uh, they seem to work well and be very occlusive. You've got to keep going. Yeah. Okay. But isn't so, your goal to really close off as proximal as possible in order to uh, avoid any damage to the collaterals in the pelvis? Yeah. So again, so what we tend to try to do is so we'll you know, we'll access this way. So we'll stop here. Uh, hold up, Catherine. We're going to access this way. We're going to do a run from the other oblique and find out where the anterior and posterior divisions are, and then try to embolize above the bifurcation of the hypogastric artery. Um, so make sure we preserve the the collaterals. So and, plug would be it would be ideal. So the problem is, um, I said it's about a 13 millimeter hypogastric, about 12 to 13 millimeter um, hypogastric. Um, so that means I'd have to put in a 14 to 16 millimeter amplaxer plug, which requires basically a seven French guide or a six French sheath to, to do that. So I could put down a six French uh, sheath, right? We have, we have the long uh, Terumo destination sheath and try to put a plug in. Uh, it, it's a long way to push a plug. Uh, and uh, but we we have done it in smaller vessels. But right now the reason for not plugging it with the actual amplatzer plug is is the the size and the, it's really the size. We, we'd have to put in something big to get yeah. down there. Yeah. So we're going to use a 12 millimeter pod here. Um, our our select catheter is basically in the origin of the hypogastric, so it sort of marks the back end. Um, we're going to basically put in a pod and we're going to try to push it right onto the bifurcation um, to help uh, to close it up and then select it out. So so we have so. 12 uh, pod is basically about 60 centimeters in length. So we'll see what we're left with, but we'll be ultimately put in probably um, a 60 centimeter packing coil to just sort of pack in densely uh, behind. Yeah. So, so we were talking about plugs before, and you know, we've all, we, when we do these cases where we give heparin and we wait for plugs to become occlusive, it may be longer than we would like. Yeah. Um, do, you think that, do you think that this type of coil gives you an advantage or a disadvantage in that situation? Uh, no, I don't think there's any advantage. It still takes time. Um, so we may have that one little loop hanging out, but I think we're probably pretty close to done. As you can see, we're already sort of flipping out. It's, it's really dense. It's packed up into a nice little ball there. Um, yeah. So, and obviously we have nice. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this out and we're going to check through our, it was pretty easy to get into the typo. So we're going to check through our diagnostic catheter here. It's still flowing through there. So, yeah. It's not going to, I mean, it's one loop un uncovered, and he's going to ultimately get it covered. So I'm not terribly worried uh, about yeah. it. I, yeah, yeah, and Rahul, also, I don't think that's an issue, Rahul. I think you're going to cover it. It's yeah. going to be fine. I mean, that happens not yeah. that infrequently when we do these types of cases. So I, I'm not worried about it. I think more yeah. importantly, you try to get occlusion. I yeah. think it's pretty good, though. I mean, I don't know how many more right coils you can fit in there. Yeah, I don't think so either. And then once we cover it, it's going to be fine. But we took it right up to the edge. Um, this will prevent an endo leak, which is really what we're going for. You know? So I think we're probably going to stop here, just given the fact that I don't think I have enough room to actually add any more coils. Um, and, and we'll leave it at that.